two more words then that are going to be very useful to us, which is one is top down, top down, and the other is bottom, bottom up, and these are top down processing and bottom up processing. So these, I mean, these are really ways when we're thinking about the fact that the, our, our nervous systems, these systems of atoms and proteins in the universe give rise to some representation of reality. We have to think they, they have some method, some means by which that data is that, that, that they create or a model of, of reality. And neuroscientists are beginning now to think in terms of top down and bottom up. Um, and these are actually gaining some weight kind of in the lab. We can show that the brain is actually performing these two processes. So what's really, what, what are they? They're, they're just, these are going to be very intuitively familiar to you. I'm sure as you describe these, they will, they will just come to you what they mean. It's very, they're very easy concepts. They're, they are, like I say, very intuitive, but it's important that they're also gaining ground in the lab. And we're showing that the brain, not only are these just nice ways to explain it, but they are, they do seem to be actually happening in the brain. Um, so, so bottom-up processing, we'll start with, is sometimes called data-driven. Data-driven. And that's because it really begins with data. As you can imagine, it starts from the bottom and builds uh, a perception of reality from there. Um, th this means that the first stage then would be data. Data from the world, stimuli out there in the universe that our senses can detect and trans, uh, transduce um, into information in the senses. Once that's kind of occurred, that data can be taken and passed on to, um, I suppose the next phase we could call it the feature detectors. You know, our brain starts to take that data and begin to analyze certain patterns in the data. I'm looking at my desk now, so my brain is picking out perhaps horizontal lines, vertical lines, the various curves and features of the desk. Um, and then it would move on to perhaps, we'll call them context or concept, I'll say, concept uh, areas where our brain begins to kind of draw on, on memories and experience and begin to kind of create some meaning uh, added onto this. So it begins to, I begin to recognize this as a desk and so on. Um, and then I suppose we could say it moves on to the decision areas and I begin to decide how to act, what I'm going to do uh, and how to interact with the desk. So I want to put my drink on the desk or something like that. Um, so this is data driven. It begins with data and builds a perception from there. And we can see very clearly why this is important um, from an evolutionary step. We have to have a reality based on what's out there and, and the, so the good thing about data-driven bottom-up processing is that it's based in reality. We wouldn't have got very far out of the primordial ooze if our processing was entirely driven like a dream, just purely in the mind and there was no influence of data out there in the world. Um, one of the problems of this is that it can be quite slow, you know, it has to go through all of these steps before it gets to a decision. Um, the, the, the other process then, top-down processing, as you can imagine, is exactly the opposite. It's sometimes called expectation-driven, expectation, or, or even knowledge-driven, knowledge-driven. Um, I mean, this is something that I was very interested in top-down processing for years before I even knew that top-down processing existed as a, as a scientific concept. Uh, you know, many people are fascinated by the way beliefs drive actions and, and even control our own experience. As they say, I, I took a big interest in people who believed the Earth is flat, you know, and how that drives their ability to filter out all opposing information so that everything seems to prove their, their theory. That kind of thing we, we might be very familiar with, but on, even on a personal level, it's more difficult perhaps to see it in ourselves, uh, but, it, but it does occur. Um, so we would then begin with stage four, I'll put, I'll put one instead of reversing this completely. So stage one would be a decision about the way the world is, about what is out there, what is likely to be out there. Um, that would that could then 
filter down onto our I'm putting getting all my numbers a bit so one the second stage then would be that would filter down onto the concept so our decisions about what's out there would influence the concept center so we would uh, that would trigger the the quicker recognition of certain concepts um, that could be passed on to feature detectors and ultimately what could happen is our decision at stage one the information from how we've decided the world is could filter down and and affect the way that the data is perceived in our senses. It could literally turn off. Uh, our decision about the world could stimulate or turn off certain um, receptors, data receptors and so on. And it's interesting to note that there are a lot of um, um, neurons feeding back from uh, from the, the the cortex feeding downwards to towards the data there are there are even uh, more downwards fibers from the cortex uh, than bottom up from the eyes so this is this is very interesting that there there is a lot of this going on but what's what's really to gain by this you know we know we have to have this reality based uh, processing we know we have to have reality but this is quicker if you're in a place where you, if you're uh, an ancient uh, man, a primordial creature of some sort, and you're out in a field, it's one thing to to have to recognise, to see the data of the tiger in the brushes and analyse that, pick out the features, figure out what it is, and then make a decision. But if you already know that you're in the domain of a tiger or that there might be something out there waiting to eat you, then the very first sign of that breaking twig that you hear already tells your entire nervous system that this is the tiger um, and you go running um, in already deciding that, that that there's a tiger out there you might even come away with a story about how you really saw the tiger and so on that's the the way that knowledge down processing can really influence us um, Michael Shermer does a great TED talk on knowledge on kind of top-down processing I'll, I'll post a link to that so, so this seems to be for it allows it, although it has a, there there can be more errors. Perhaps one way to think about this is if you were waiting for your friend at a bus stop, right? Um, if you knew your friend was coming, then you might accidentally mistake a few people for him because you've got this decision that anybody coming could be your friend. So they, there's there's room for there, there could be quite a few errors. But when he does come, you'll recognise him much quicker than if say. If you, if you weren't expecting him and he showed up by accident, you would have to analyse his face, figure out the features, decide, oh, this is my friend, and then greet your friend. So, it's, so this is quicker, which is obviously has some evolutionary advantages, but it, it takes, you know, it, it's based on experience and learning. So as we grow and we, we develop a lot of experience and learning, we begin to transfer what would have been data-driven processing over to expectation areas uh, as things become familiar and as answers become available from memory rather than having to pick them out from the world. Um, there are some interests... I, I mentioned in one of the other videos about this idea that we have a fusiform face gyrus, right? This, this area in our minds specifically designed for recognising faces, designed specifically evolved to help us to recognise faces. Um, we have a great capacity to recognise faces. We can pick faces out of many, many different shapes. We have things like the man in the moon, the face on Mars. We, we, see for, we only have to see a, a few shapes and already this is just two dots and a line and we can already recognise this as a face. Now hopefully, hopefully just then as as I've brought up this picture, I've managed to talk you around enough that you saw a face right here. You saw two eyes and a mouth. This is actually an illusion called the rat man picture. You may already by now be aware that this is also an ambiguous picture which shows a rat with a long tail here and two ears. Now, as, as, it, as it actually says here, if I, I just prepped you with with I, I started speaking about faces i brought up to your mind this idea that you might encounter faces that there are fa that you're very good at recognizing faces um, and then i flash this image up and for most of you you probably saw the face straight away and that is an example you that that, that the person had been set for one interpretation 
of what what was about to come up. But if I had, and I would love to have been able to do both in some dual reality where we could go back in time and do it again, where if I'd prepped you instead by talking about, if I'd said um, that you have this great capacity to perceive animals, you know, we have to we have to be able to recognise scuttling animals and small animals very quickly because there's a great possibility of disease and how important it is that you need to be able to recognise animals and how I had a pet mouse and so on and so forth, uh, and then brought this up, you would more likely, as, di as did happen in these experiments, you would have seen the rat first. Um, and that is another example of expectation driven processing and how it can occur and affect our perception. But this is something again we'll come back to. I'm just introducing this now as a concept. Um, it's something we'll come back to as we look at each of the senses in turn. But I hope that gives you a bit of an idea uh, as to what top-down processing and bottom-up processing mean and what people are referring to when they talk about that. And hopefully you'll begin to kind of think about that in your everyday life.